times at different time these past few months they have gathered even up to 200,000 maybe even 300,000 uh, people and uh, nowadays they gather in thousands even to this day basically um, in a sense protesting against the new law to be realized or implemented in uh, Montenegro or Tanagora, which has much to do with controlling church property by the state. And the state, by the way, is very anti-Orthodox um, Christian. It's very anti-Serbian Orthodox Church. Uh, it's very anti-ethnic, at least. That's what it seems from what I know. Um, so thousands of people have uh, gathered and had these uh, processions, uh, these church processions. Um, in addition to those processions, I'm sure that many of you have seen on TV that we have um, quite a few people coming out uh, in protests here in America these uh, past a few weeks and for this reason I wanted to touch upon that subject uh, to a degree but let me begin by sharing why um, why I came up with this theme I asked Miroslav to advertise ejection from paradise this past Sunday just to give you a, a brief um, history, or not, not history necessarily, a, a brief, um, a few words regarding my parish. Um, I'm very blessed. And when I say I am, I mean, we all here at our St. Nicholas Church in Indianapolis, Indiana, we have been very, very blessed with many things. Uh, one of the things which is a great blessing, um, I have three Serbian retired priests who are connected to the parish in one way or another. And um, one young, younger than me at least, American priest who is obviously an Orthodox Christian priest and who is somewhat also attached to um, my parish. Uh, lately, I have been asking them to give sermons every once in a while because I figure I've been here 21 years in this parish. Um, sorry, something happened on my phone. I've been here 21 years. In fact, this is my first parish, my only parish. And I honestly mean this when I say it. Um, I don't think... I am a good sermon giver to begin with, but then in addition to that, I think people have heard everything I have to offer. Um, the only thing I've been hoping for and hope for to this day and will continue to hope for, that it's not, not me talking, but the Holy Spirit. That's why all of us priests, no matter what we prepare for a sermon, we always turn around to the icon of Christ or simply face the people and always begin by saying in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit that's what everyone else hears what you don't hear is the priest says to himself god allow me to speak and then he says in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit in other words let the holy trinity one god uh three persons take over and speak to the people uh, through my wretchedness. Um, we believe this. Uh, the clergy especially believe this is a reality. In fact, um, at the beginning of every divine liturgy, if a priest has a deacon, the deacon reminds him of that. The deacon comes up to him quietly and he says, Father, 
it is time for the Lord to take over. Bless. And the priest then blesses. The deacon usually says that by saying, it is time um, to offer praise to God. And then priest says, blessed is our God, and so on and so forth. But what he means is, it is time for the Lord to take over. And the priest agrees that the Lord takes over um, the divine liturgy. Um, in any case, um, we've, we've had the clergy uh, give uh, sermons lately. And this past Sunday, a retired priest who um, is very well known in our church in America, Father Jovan Todorovic, gave an excellent, amazing sermon. Um, and to be honest with you, every time he doesn't speak, being that he's older, I feel a bit uncomfortable, mainly because uh, it's only natural, I think, for a younger person to think to themselves, what am I to share in front of someone who has so much experience? But again, we hope that the Holy Spirit is the one who speaks. In any case, he said something that was old school. Mentioned being ejected from the kingdom of heaven. In other words, being thrown out from paradise. If we don't do certain things, if we don't turn uh, back to God, if we don't uh, believe if we don't believe um, in God and do his will. And it made me think um, quite a bit. And I'll tell you why. Uh, mainly because I grew up in a home, my father being a priest, and uh, Father Sloboda knows my father well. Um, me being a priest son growing up in the old country for most of my part of my life uh, and my grandfather being um, a very dedicated orthodox christian um, i basically grew up i don't know about you but i grew up fearing god um, almost as if i grew up in the old testament god was a judge to me uh, he was a father, but a very tough father. If you didn't obey, you were punished. Uh, that's how I grew up. In seminary uh, that I went to in the old country, um, I also went through a similar type of education. Most of my professors were, as, as I just mentioned, old school. So I grew up fearing God. But then at one point in my life, when I went to higher theological education, I didn't like the idea of fearing God. And then I started studying more and learning how God is a loving father, not a, a rough um, uh, judge. So I went from fearing God to loving God, from being afraid of God to um, understanding his love for me. Um, I went from uh, looking at him as a judge to simply looking at him as, as a father. Um, and it was an amazing feeling. Uh, that transformation from, from, from a, a judge to a loving father was a huge thing for me as a, as a young Orthodox Christian. Uh, and the more I studied, the more I learned about his love, the more I saw his love. But I hate to say it, and I hate to admit it, um, the less I feared him, the more I opened up myself to all kinds of things, not paying too much attention to how I strayed away from that path to the kingdom of heaven. In other words, um, sin became not as important in my life. Um, and at first it felt good. And to be completely honest with you, 
lately, the past couple of years, I had an, a very unique feeling up until that sermon last Sunday when I realized what the problem was. Um, the problem was that I went from fearing God to loving God, from looking at him as a judge to looking at him as a father. But I, I lost in the process. I, I love the feeling, but I lost the fear of God. And when you lose the fear of God, um, you can get yourself into all kinds of uh, stuff. Uh, not that I had the, the, the opportunity to get myself in, into all kinds of stuff. I've been a priest for almost 25 years now, if you consider me being a deacon. Um, but it definitely came to mind and it became obvious that it's not one or the other. It's actually both which have to be within each and every one of us. We must have the fear of God. And that's one thing that I uh, wish I would have instilled in my children more, as my parents did in me. And we must experience God as a loving father. So in other words, it is a balance uh, between one and the other. And why is this balance important? It's important because the kingdom of heaven is at stake. And that's something that in this day and age, if you say out loud, it's not even popular. That's probably why I stopped thinking about it, why I stopped using it. People don't want to hear negative things. They want to hear positive things. They don't want to hear tough things. They want to hear easy things. Um, uh, you know, it, it, especially I'm sure that if there are any other priests, any priest would, would, would agree with this. People nowadays love motivational speakers more than anything or anyone, you know, instant gratification. Um, and I fell into that. I fell into that so much that I forgot how important it is to have the fear of God at the same time. Because if you don't, there is that other reality, the reality of being ejected from the kingdom of heaven, not by God, but by yourself. It literally, not having the fear of God is literally like um, being in a nice jet, one of those military jets, smoothing nicely, and then all of a sudden pulling that lever that ejects you from, from the plane. Um, for no reason. So um, that's what we do whenever we don't have the fear of God. And it's not the fear of God, as I mentioned earlier, where we fear he is a uh, ruthless judge, but the fear of God as the fear of, a, of, of and towards a loving parent. So that's one thing I wanted to share with you. The other thing, um, and let me see here. I just want to look at the time. I think I, I you know what, Miroslav, what do you say? I think I went over time. I, I actually wanted you know, to. No, Father, just go on. You, go on. That's fine. That's fine. You can talk whatever you let want. Me, Usually let I me. give my lectures sometimes like 40, 45 minutes. So definitely you are way behind me. You can okay. just go proceed but whatever let time me, you need. Let me start. Let me stop here for a moment and maybe ask yes, any yes. of you, and please feel free um, to ask anything, whether on this subject or, or another subject. But do you have any questions regarding what I just said? And I know we don't know each other, but please um, don't think that there is a silly question, God forbid, a stupid question. Your question may be something I may not understand, but don't feel you shouldn't ask because it sounds silly. Yeah, please, at this point, let's open the discussion and please uh, uh, unmute yourself, whoever wants to just put some question. Oh, Father Slobodan is here, okay, <laughs> great. I, am, I did unmute, but I don't have from my top of my head uh, any questions so far. <laughs> <clears throat> Mm. 
Okay. I'm going to wait 10 seconds and then <laughs> well, I'm going to start. Go ahead. Yeah, I I wonder rather than Oh, is saying, this Ivana? Is this Ivana? Yes. Oh, yes, Ivana, yeah, welcome. This is our person. Hi. Hi. So I'm just wondering if rather than saying fear of God, because, you know, it sounds like so intimidating, you know, can't we like transition to like respect, uh, you know, respect that there is a boundary and that God can, you know, strike you down any minute. So respect, you know, rather than the fear, because I mean, fear is, is like so intimidating. And I mean, cool. God can do anything with us at any time. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, I think if there is a balance, like a parent child relationship, uh, you know, you have to have some form of boundary and, um, you know, you have to respect what the expectation is that God is putting out there. I think. Exactly. I, I think you put it very well. Um, we do use that term. In fact, in the church, we use many terms which don't translate very well into modern English. Um, in, in fact, sometimes it's hard to translate until, unless you understand the substance of the word. Um, strach Boji, um, the fear of God, which would be translated, let's say, from, from, from uh, Serbian, does sound quite intimidating, but... Uh, in essence, it is exactly what you said. It's more of a um, loving relationship with respect to the one who loves you so much. Um, so I, I think you explained it very well, and thank you for that. Thank that's you. Exactly, um, that's exactly it. I don't know. I, I sort of, and, and this, you know, this may sound a little silly and a lot of people listening into it, but um, I had an experience when I was eight years old and um, I feel that, I mean, God, uh, I have experienced um, so much love from that event uh, from God that even so that there is a boundary and that we respect God, you know, he, he is just so forgiving with everything and anything and so loving. I, I can't describe it. And, um, it just, uh, it's always been there with me all my life since that event. And, and that's the, <laughs> the, the Orthodox Christian teaching is actually that in essence, uh, meaning um, you shouldn't not do things that are sinful because he's going to strike you dead. You should not do things that are sinful because they are contrary to uh, the one who loves you so much. Uh, and, and that's the, the ultimate goal is not to sin not because you'll be punished, but because you don't want to do something bad towards someone who loves you so much. Is that um, more No, clear? I guess what I'm trying to say is he's so, um, I mean, I, I, I got injured, actually. I injured. I got injured, and uh, the injury was so bad that I fainted. And in that process, for me to get out of the, uh, unconscious to the conscious, um, I had this event um, and I met up with, uh, with this being. Um, I was taken actually to, to a being and he was so, in so much light. I mean, if you were to look at him, you would be looking at the sun. You couldn't see it. You couldn't see him, but I, could, I was able to see him. And there was so much love emanating from this being that it's just, um, no matter what you did, it was forgiven. Um, so I think that in a way, you know, people sin, oh, God's going to forgive me. Yeah, you know, he probably is, but you shouldn't be behaving that way to get to that point. Um, you should have, I mean, uh, you know, 
the, the love I experienced was more than just from mother or father. It, it was, um, it was uh, just uh, forgiving and no matter what, what I did or w- would have done, uh, it, would, it, it was just, um, he was just, just very, very, uh, you know, encompassing and loving and understanding is, I guess, understanding. But the thing, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to ascertain here is just still there is this boundary that we have to keep um, and know that we should do better than, you know, behave uh, in a certain way or badly or, or uh, do things that um, are not uh, conscionable or um, the behavior that would be uh, you know, not within our religious um, aspects and le- learnings and teachings. Yes, when you had the experience that you had, if there was something focusing on that love and feeling that love and feeling that forgiveness, if there was something, I don't want to say something specific, but generally speaking, let's say if there was something sinful right next to it, would you focus on that sinful for, for a second or would you be focused on being immersed in that type of love? Uh, I don't know. It was just, uh, I, I was, um, I mean, I was walking in, the, uh, in very dark clouds when, when I was unconscious and a uh, little boy came next to me and he brought me, he said, this is the way I'll show you the way. And so I came to the area and there was lots of people there. Uh, and there was this uh, person, this man um, that was emanating so much light. And um, I really didn't want to leave, but he told me I had to leave. And it was just uh, a lot of, um, I felt it from 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 that being. I felt it. I felt the love, the the Im- tremendous, uh, immense, uh, incomprehensible love that I, I I I I just cannot explain. Un- unconditional. Unconditional. Yes. Yeah. That. Yes. I I I completely understand. I mean, that's that's on that's um, talked about quite a bit by the holy fathers and mothers in the church and. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, many people do experience and feel that love in one way or another. The Holy Fathers do say that um, we are not almost not capable to continuously experience that love under these conditions. That's why in eternity that will be a whole different, um, whole different story. But to experience the love um, under these conditions, that type of a love is hard um, continuously because we're surrounded by, we're, we're not even, it's almost like we're not capable. We, we would be burned. It's almost like Moses of the, of the Old Testament where, where he turns his head around because he can't see the light. In any case, there is no doubt that the love of God is all-encompassing and unconditional and the love that um, is beyond um, our comprehension here and now. Um, and, and as I said, we all experience it in one way or another from time to time, and it feels good. But as you also said earlier, we have to keep ourselves um, in check and not forget the fact that um, we can easily stray away from uh, that path. And um, we should make an effort, uh, obviously, not to. And for us Orthodox Christians, that's a much easier task than maybe for many others because our church was constructed in such a way uh, that it it keeps us, continuously keeps us um, on that path. What I was mainly uh, talking about earlier when I mentioned um, the fear of God I grew up in, I should have also mentioned that the area uh, I grew up in 
was at one time um, infected by, without going into too much details, infected by uh, simply unorthodox theology, where God was only looked at as a judge. Uh, in fact, it was very Old Testament type of um, type of feeling. Um, then later on, obviously, when I discovered bits and pieces uh, of his love, which were still um, unbelievable and awesome, um, then I wanted to live that way and continue living that way. But at the same time, I realize now that the balance um, between the, let's call it, um, a, a um, uh, uh, positive, if you will, uh, fear of God, as we said earlier, uh, with the understanding that love is what is most important and, and, and what's most obvious, then it's a, it's, it shouldn't be a hard task. In any case, um, are there any other comments or questions um, before I continue? I actually only meant to uh, touch upon that for a bit so that I can um, talk about the processions. Um, the reason I, I wanted to share with you a few words about processions is because we are recently in our diocese, the Midwest Diocese of, of America in the Serbian church, um, our uh, bishop's secretary and deputy, in, in fact, organized a procession from the monastery of New Gračanica to the monastery of St. Sava, the monastery of the Most Holy Mother of God, uh, her veil to the monastery of uh, St. Sava. It's supposed to take place on July 18th uh, at 6 a.m. It is around a three-hour walk from one monastery to the other, almost seven miles. Um, when he organized that and put the word out, being it that he is a, a good friend of mine, um, he received all kinds of calls and questions. Uh, people didn't know why he was doing this. Was because it's not been done before in our diocese. Was he doing it um, to protest against racism? Was one of the questions. Police brutality. Um, 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 support for police officers, anti-globalism, um, anti-secularism, uh, godlessness, um, support for human life, dignity, freedom, um, freedom of religion in Tsarnagora, um, uh, against or for the virus. I mean, he had all kinds of questions come up as to why uh, we are doing this as a diocese. So um, he basically, his short answer was, we are doing it for all of that and not taking any of that into consideration. And then he went to explain what a procession for us Orthodox Christians is. And I must say, I'm mostly taking what I will share with you from what he shared with um, the people that he uh, invited to listen uh, through Zoom and, and I believe Facebook Live. But it was in Serbian, and I do plan on doing a Facebook Live in English to explain uh, what and why, what are processions and why do we have them. Now, I'm sure many of you have experienced the regular processions, 
And the regular procession usually takes place around feast days, specifically during Great and Holy Week. Um, we have a procession around the church one or three times, usually three times, on Great and Holy Friday, when we take out the shroud of Christ and we um, walk around the church. We have a procession at um, the matins of the resurrectional service, right before we serve liturgy. Usually that's done on Saturdays at midnight or something like that. And then we go around the church um, three times. Um, those processions, and I just came back from the Holy Land a few months ago for the first time, uh, those processions have a lot to do with um, visiting specific places or going from one place to the other um, in the Holy Land where all of that actually happened. Um, so we cannot all go to Jerusalem to follow the, the procession from the place where Christ was captured to the place where he was beaten to the place where he was judged to the place where um, he was um, crucified to the place where he was buried. Um, over there, obviously, you wouldn't be walking in a circle like around our churches at that time because we don't have those specific stations, as the Roman Catholics call them. Um, you would be actually going from the actual place to the other actual place in a somewhat straight, wavy uh, procession. In addition to that procession around Great and Holy Week, there's another kind of procession which is done from a church to a legacy tree. In Serbian, it's called Zapis. Um, legacy tree, for the most part, and we have one on our church property, is a tree with an engraved cross on it. And once a year, on, usually on the celebration of the patron of that parish, people walk from the church to that tree and back, holding crosses, icons, banners, all kinds of things. Um, the, the reason these trees are established for the most part on church property are, I will, I will explain in, in just a minute. For example, when we bought our land here in Indianapolis, Indiana, there was nothing on the land. So what we did as is a custom for us, we found the biggest, nicest tree on the property. We engraved a cross on the tree, and that was our church until we built a church. That's where we gathered. So if we had a service, everyone knows to go to that tree, stand in front of the cross. That's where we prayed. That's where we served liturgy, everything out there. When we built the church, then in reminding ourselves of how we started, we usually go for a procession once a year to the tree uh, and back. That's another reason people go or partake of these processions. Another type of procession or processions are the ones that we see now in Montenegro, in Cernagora, where people, uh, not in a riot, uh, walking in prayer, gather and go from one area to the other, making their stand against the unjust um, treatment of now um, what actually um, happens in these processions 
And how are they called? I must uh, admit to you that up until Father Serafim explained it the way that he did, I didn't think of these processions as being that important. Um, obviously, I've learned about them. We, many of us know about them, but you kind of uh, think to yourself, why do I have to walk? I can just go to church and pray. Uh, but there is a reason. Um, in fact, um, these processions are Kresnivhod. Kresnivhod means walking in the way of the cross. In other words, walking in the way of Christ. Now, we all know the way that he walked and the example that he gave us. These are also called uh, prayer walks. Um, there are two walks of life that we all partake of. One is a walk of sin, and the other one is a walk of righteousness. Generally speaking, that's our life. Now, why do we gather and walk in these processions and how does this um, matter in our spiritual lives? Well, first of all, we all know Christ himself said, where two or three are gathered in my name, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in uh, their midst. We all know that, especially in the Old Testament, we hear uh, how whenever we make some type of an effort or go through some type of a roughness, for example, walking for three hours, being tired, heading to a specific place of holiness. In this case, in our case, it's heading from one monastery to the other where we have the relics of St. Mardarie, the actual body, the whole body of a, of a saint. And why are we walking there? Because we're walking to witness the miracle of God, how God can take a, a man who's been buried 80 years ago and make his whole body incorrupt. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. And when we make that effort, when we go through roughness, we are purified like gold. As we read in the, in the Old Testament, God says uh, to his people, um, I will put you uh, in fire so that you can be cleansed like gold. Um, that's why we come together. That's what we expect uh, from it. Now, another reason why we walk is we walk in the name of all those who are unable to walk. We make the effort in the name of all those who are unable to uh, make uh, that uh, effort, walking that path um, of uh, Christ. I wanted to share with you also um, a little story uh, that I heard. Obviously, whenever we do these type of things like the procession in which we are expected to focus on our own life in a sense, not only focus on the life of Christ and his walk before he was crucified and died on the cross, but also uh, focus on our own life and our own past in life, our own present, and also our future. Where do we want to go on this path of either righteousness or uh, uh, sin? The focus is definitely, the, the, the processions are set up so we would focus on these things. Because Why? Because we are carrying a cross or an icon. We're in a group of people who are all like-minded. They came there to make that effort to walk in prayer, to meditate while they're, while they're walking. 
So we, we pretty much put aside all the noise of this world and almost enter into a different kind of a world where we will focus on Christ, but also our own route of the past, where we were, where we are, and where we uh, want to be. It's interesting that um, people do lose focus in those processions, um, and that's natural too. You know, there was a there was a story where in Russia they were heading from one city to a very holy monastery in which there was a service, and some of the people heard that I don't know some of the trees around the monasteries are holy, so they were chipping little pieces of the tree to carry back home. They didn't even enter the church. They went back home, came around the monastery into the woods, took a little bit of a tree and, and, and went back, missed the point. But the point of the procession is not to miss the point and not to lose the focus, but to focus on that which is, um, which is heavenly, uh, to focus on uh, the incarnate God, Christ, our Lord, and to also focus on ourselves and um, our uh, path. Just give me a moment. I had something else I wanted to share with you. Um, let's see here. Uh -huh. At last, I wanted to, to say, as far as processions are concerned, um, which is something I really wanted to mostly focus on and share with you, is that processions bring us to the point of soberness, um, wakes us up, as, as the uh, Greeks say, uh, uh, takes us to the po point of, of, of nipsis, which is basically awareness. And we all know that in today's age and stage, where we have um, TVs, we have computers, we have cell phones, so much of distraction that being in such a procession, if we do it correctly, uh, understanding that this is a walk of prayer, understanding that this is a walk of of meditation, understanding that this is a route which Christ took, and this is a route of self-examination, um, then we will come to nipsis or awareness. And when we do, this in itself will bring us to who God created us to be. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, regarding um, the processions um, or any questions for that matter? I, I was talking to Miroslav uh, these past few days and I know he mentioned that uh, there may be someone interested in um, either youth work um, that I have done for 20 plus years. And if you have any questions regarding that, I'd be more than glad to attempt to, to answer or any of the things I, I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, would you, Father, would you compare some other walkings uh, in our cities uh, for cancer survivors or uh, for victims of abortion and uh, walking for life, as we all know? Uh, that um, are very often asked, even sometimes uh, Orthodox uh, bishops are joining uh, in uh, that type of walking uh, and so many others, but not every walk for specific reason is uh, uh, litia or procession of religious kind that we um, are talking about, uh, because uh, that is uh, certainly uh, more than anything, a uh, prayerful walk. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, uh, compare a little bit um, 
uh, litias in Montenegro and uh, destructive prote uh, protests in Belgrade uh, yesterday and today. Oh, that's a, a loaded, a loaded question. So you, um, you know. <laughs> I will tell you one thing, and I, I will share that, which I'm sure you also know. Um, it's a good question, and it's very tough to, um, th there are many things obviously to compare there. Um, if the, the, the pr let me just say this. If we know anything about the processions in, Montenegro or Tsanagora, um, we do know that this exactly and specifically is the way to approach any and every problem. Everything else, I really don't know that much of in order to uh, make a good assumption or even or, or god forbid judgment i will tell you one thing i have a group of mountain climbers in the parish and every year around transfiguration they pick one of the highest mountains in america and they fast and pray reading the book of psalms while they climb up the mountain then when they do they put up a cross there many times if they have a priest with them they do divine liturgy praying for this country and all those who live in it as well as their own families and everyone who has gone on these mountain climbing trips compares them quite a bit to processions now if someone is violent um i don't know that personally i would condone that uh but uh it's also very hard to to judge it especially nowadays when the media is so good in manipulating things. Um, obviously, for us as Orthodox Christians and Christians in general, violence is not an option. Why? Because we learned that if someone hits you on one side, you turn the other. Now, someone must, might, might say, well, how about the saints like St. Nicholas, who slapped Arius? Or um, who, who else was it? Uh, Athanasius, who was um, very rough at times, I believe. Um, how about them? Well, my response personally is usually, when you are like St. Nicholas, then go ahead and be violent. Uh, other than that, um, it's not in our nature. Uh, we would rather be inflicted by pain than inflict pain um, unto others. And our Lord showed us that himself. When Peter took out the sword to protect Jesus and cut off the ear of that soldier, Christ told him, put your knife back. Um, because that's not our approach. Um, we, we don't act that way towards people, no matter what they do to us. Um, so it's, as I said, it's, it's tough to say, but one thing is not tough to say is how it should be done. And it should be done with crosses and icons and prayer. You know, I'll tell you one thing and I'll finish here. Uh, when this pandemic started in the world, our sisters, KSS, they started reading the book of Psalms, all 150 Psalms, every single week. What we would do is, if there are 10 sisters who would join on a teleconference, 
we have a little introduction, maybe five, 10 minutes. Um, we say a little prayer and then we distribute the Psalms. If 10 of them show up at the teleconference meeting, then each of them gets 15 different Psalms so that every week the whole book of Psalms would be read. And I can't tell you what kind of response we received uh, from each and every sister. I mean, they, to, to many of them, it saved them from, from you know, going, going berserk in their, in their head. Um, that's our approach. Now, I, at the same time, when it comes to, you know, walking for uh, cancer, for life, or whatever, people who do that, I would, I, I, I would dare to say that that type of a procession is very similar to the one which is a church procession because it's from the heart. You know, someone who walks for for cancer usually is a person who either suffered themselves or knows someone who has. And anyone who knows or has suffered through this illness knows how rough of an illness it is. And there's no doubt in my mind that God is with them when they walk. At the same time, I doubt that God is with present with anyone who um, chooses uh, violence. Thank you so much, Father, for this such inspirative and uh, splendid lecture, which unified, in fact, uh, two subjects in a wonderful way. Please, uh, anybody, any comment or question at this point? Uh, Father, great job. I can say uh, even uh, with my uh, tough questions, uh, he responded so well that I agree 100% on uh, whatever he said. Yeah, I agree. That, I'm glad that you agree because I question myself all the time. Mm -hmm. And I usually, that's one of the reasons when I came to the parish, uh, we had a very short um, mailing list. And in fact, for some reason, the two of the priests who were in town, as well as the other Orthodox clergy, were not on that mailing list. One of the first things that I did is I included all the clergy uh, just so they could check on me. And uh, there is a Bulgarian priest uh, who is especially tuned in whenever I either say something or uh, write something. And I truly appreciate it because it's very easy to, to stray, you know, we need to keep each other in, in check, if you will. And as I said, I don't know that I said anything to anyone here that you may have not heard or may not know in your own heart, but at least we can be reminded of it, if nothing else. And to very inspirative uh, examples, which you gave good as well and at this point i have just maybe one notice or kind of question father what's your opinion or what's your point of view about the, the fact that at these processions or litanies there are way more people in total than that would we have let's say in any church in montenegro or even taken together at one sunday's liturgy in the church all over the montenegro let's say we have maybe a few hundred or a few thousand people but at this point we have like 200 or 300,000 people men who are walking in the streets it's kind of unity or unification of let's say people faithful people at the same time a way of how to say like expression of their uh, uh, some kind of uh, unification beyond the level of unification which we have in a gathering for the divine liturgy. So should we appreciate this as kind of uh, same level as a divine liturgy or it's kind of, uh, let's say, something, uh, whatever, superior or inferior from that or how to consider that, how to put our, let's say, point of view on that. What's your opinion regarding that? Obviously, the divine liturgy is the divine liturgy, and there's nothing greater than it. Um, in fact, the whole church 
rests on the foundation of the divine liturgy. Uh, that's the foundation of our church. That's the foundation of our faith. That's the foundation of all mysteries. That's everything. Absolutely. And in fact, that's one of the things that I've said many times when at our diocesan meetings, when people asked, how do we keep the youth in our church? My answer through experience and also hearing and learning, obviously, from others has always been there are two most important things that, that the youth experience. The one thing is love from the community. And the other thing is the understanding of the divine liturgy. That's what will bring them back and keep them there. Why? Number one, well, because everyone like, loves to be loved. So why wouldn't you go back to love? You're going to go to college. You're going to experience all kinds of stuff. And then where are you going to go? You're going to go to them who love you. That's why it's important that the community offers love to the youth. Um, unconditional love, as the, as the sister said uh, earlier, that she experienced from, from uh, her experience, from God, we would, we would uh, uh, understand. And the other thing is, why divine liturgy? Because there's nothing like it. No one else can offer them divine liturgy. And that's why they need to learn what divine liturgy actually is, that it's the only service in the whole world in the history of mankind that offers an opportunity for a person to enter into the kingdom of heaven here and now. So there's nothing greater than that. However, when people do come together, when people invite God in their midst, I don't doubt for a second that God will also offer a similar blessing to them. What has been the case in Cernagora, Montenegro, is a miracle. But if you knew the history, and I'm not saying that you don't, but I'm just saying as a form of speech, if you knew the history of that region, you would understand that they've been long waiting for this miracle. And glory be to God, and thanks be to the holy people leading them, number one, Metropolitan uh, Amphilochius, and also those other bishops. I mean, I know most of the bishops in Montenegro, and they're, they're top-of-the-line stuff. I mean, these are people who are dedicated to God more than one can imagine. So it doesn't surprise me that these people have risen. It doesn't surprise me that God is in their midst. It doesn't surprise me that they come back to it. It's one thing if, if 200,000 people out of a country that has 550,000. The country, the whole country has what? 600,000 people? Yes. Someone must know. Mm -hmm. With so uh, minorities. Half of the country went out on the streets not to protest, not to break, not to steal, not to beat, not to yell bad stuff, but to pray and to hold icons and crosses it's unbelievable. Many of these people, their conscience brought them out and their heart is bringing them back. They can't have enough of it. You know, there's a priest from our diocese who actually went there from America. He went to experience this. And I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you per myself personally, if it wasn't for this COVID-19 thing that we're dealing with, I would be on the first plane to Senagora. Because everyone, including my friends who are from there, who, 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 who share the experience that they've had, compares to the holiest places I've been to. And more than that, it's an unbelievable feeling. They say the presence of God in, those, in, in, those, in the midst of those thousands of people is unbelievable. But you know, I, I also have to say another thing. It's not the thousands of people. It's the hearts that are joined for the right purpose. So even if there's five people from your church, the same thing can be felt. You know, that's one thing that I confirmed when I went to the Holy Land. 
I thought to myself, I went to all those holy places. I've been to exactly the place where, where Jesus was captured. I was at the place where he uh, um, was put on the cross, where he died on the cross, where he laid on the tomb. And there's no doubt it was an unbelievable feeling. But I will also tell you, there's no less of his presence and that feeling in Indianapolis, Indiana during Great and Holy Week. Nope. Because we make an effort to invite him there. That's why there's no, there's no difference. I really didn't feel it. I mean, I felt great. But if someone will tell me, I need to go there to feel the same thing. I tell them, nope, you can do it at St. Nicholas Church in Indianapolis or Saratoga or San Francisco or, or wherever. It's the truth. Yeah, maybe we need to be reminded about um, the, that in Montenegro before Metropolitan and Philokia, there was uh, nothing, practically nothing. Churches were places for goats. And uh, uh, nothing. Uh, with the coming of Metropolitan Amphilochia, Montenegro, churches all remodeled, brand new, built, everything. And people saw that, and that's why they responded in so great numbers. Because uh, there was a try uh, to steal their identity, uh, and they felt that, and, and that they need to come out on the street and respond to, uh, to those uh, uh, who are now um, uh, uh, holding government positions. And um, we call uh, state is against the Serbian Orthodox Church. No state, but one political party and, uh, uh, is against the church and its leader uh, who happened currently being president of the Montenegro, but uh, and, uh, they are not Montenegro. Montenegro always understand and, uh, that Montenegro of Njegos, they were always and will remain always Serbian. The best Serbian, we call it. You know what's, what's amazing is those people come out because they want to literally protect holy places, mm -hmm. even though many of them are not necessarily religious. I watched one of the videos the, the one of the bishops was teaching people how to say the Lord's Prayer. They didn't even know the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. He said, repeat after me, our Father, and then 100,000 people, our Father, who art in heaven, who art in heaven. An un unbelievable thing. The other interesting thing was when this virus started, the Metropolitan and the bishops of Tsetinje told the people not to come out because of the virus. They had 30,000 people in front of the church. And what does that tell you? It doesn't say, you know, it's, it's not that they, uh, they were disobedient. What that tells me is that they deep down understand the structure of the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church is not governed by a patriarch, a bishop, or a priest. The, the head governor of each and every parish is actually Christ himself. The bishops and the priests are in, in place, physically speaking, but the people understood that. And they were drawn literally by the, by the head of the church, who is Christ. Yeah, that's great. Oh, I'm sorry, Miroslav, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go, go for it. Yeah. It's your... uh, okay, so if you didn't have any question, I might have a question for Father. Yes. Yeah, okay, so uh, uh, Father, this here's one from the uh, parent state of point. Um, seeing all those uh, uh, Lithias coming uh, there those procession in, in Montenegro, I saw a lot of uh, youth on the street holding the uh, cr like crosses and, and icons and everything. And since I'm a parent and I'm also involved in a Sunday school, um, I uh, cannot uh, ask myself how I can reflect uh, love of God 
to my uh, my children and to the children that I, I'm kind of uh, involved uh, in uh, in teaching them in, in Sunday school. And I also, so uh, I have a, I mean, it's not a question, but I just want to ask you, do you have any advice uh, for, for parents how to um, maintain that love and how to raise an Orthodox Christian child, how to get the child love uh, the God uh, uh, that much as I see that the children or youth uh, loves uh, uh, love it in, in in Montenegro. I didn't see it before, uh, nowhere else like that. Um, and um, you know, like uh, um, I'm, uh, I cannot tell that I've been hearing the the some states like, uh, but I, I I can sense some states when I sometimes uh, mention the Bible reading to to the kids or. Um, I, I can sense the, the feeling in a parent like Bible reading is for monks. Am I turning my child in a monk? Uh, so the, like, uh, and even though I know it's necessary, uh, that it's not necessary to turn our child to a monk, it's just necessary to make them in a Christians, into a Christians. I also uh, cannot, uh, cannot like stop myself to react to 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 that like feeling to that um and i also always um like um ask myself or uh like how how i can help how i can actually really uh be the part of those uh, processions here and like you know if you like if i can if i am exaggerating uh uh by forgive me but like I would like, even though I'm so far from the procession, I would like to have the procession in my heart always, and I have to, I would love to uh, reflect that processions. I don't know if you understand my question. It might be hard or it might be too, too wide. I do, and I do, and, and it is a, it's an excellent question, uh, as, um, and I, I myself, uh, we have three children, uh, two girls and and a boy. My one of my daughters finished uh, college. The other one's finishing next year, and my son's finishing high school. Um, and I will tell you, I how old are your children, by the way? Uh, I have three girls. Um, uh, one is uh, just turned nine. Um, Irina turned nine, Kalina turned six in March, and Nicoletta is turning four. So they're very yeah. young. <laughs> they're little. Yeah. So I'll tell you um, what I have done in my own home, what I have preached, what I have learned from others. That's why I have done it in my home and preached to other people. Um, the, 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 um, and, and, and again, I will tell you before I say anything, I'll tell you that I failed miserably as a parent. Um, I, um, now, now that I look back, I wish I would have done so much more, but at the same time, I have learned that quite a few parents feel that they haven't done a, a, good job um that's why by the way grandparents are much better parents because they have a second chance to be <laughs> parents and we only had it so far we've had one chance and one thing that i'll tell you is in seminary i remember writing a paper on that subject who uh how to be a perfect parent and i remember the first thing that came to my mind who is a perfect parent? Who can I think of? And then I thought, well, there's only one perfect parent. He's in the kingdom of heaven. Um, we just have to do the best that we can under the circumstances. Um, what we've done, what we've learned to do, is to teach our children about the faith in love as much as we can um, from the early age on. So 
not worrying, like you said, you know, worrying, am I telling him too much? Am I teaching him too much? No, 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 you're not. Doing the daily, you know, basic Orthodox Christian stuff, daily prayer, fasting in the home, taking to confession, and all these things I'm sure you know, but if you don't know, you can ask your priest and he can tell you what those things are. Um, so prayer, fasting, confession, communion, um, Visiting other Orthodox churches, I thought was good. Going to funerals, um, I, I thought was important for children. Praying in the morning, praying in the evening, visiting monasteries, reading Bible stories, reading the lives of the Holy Fathers, putting novels, Orthodox Christian novels of saints in front of the, the preteens and teens who like to read, like my two daughters, they love to read. My, my son doesn't like to read that much, but I still ended up push it was crazy john when your kids are teenagers make sure they read that they're gonna like it but there are many other books out there that are novels interesting to read about princesses and so on and so forth a uh, big thing for me was getting my children used to monasteries i grew up in monasteries um and i love it, it it's my favorite place uh i know that if no one would accept me for what I did or am or who I am, I could always go to a monastery and they will offer me that unconditional God's love. Um, so now that's up to a certain age, up to preteen age. At the preteen age, which is around 11, 12 uh, for girls, then you start slowly releasing them. Um, you know, I, I, I remember I think it was at the beginning of high school that I uh, wrote a little note to each of my children um, on the big, thick prayer book that I gave them and basically told them, if you have problems in life, this is where you find the answer uh, to, to, to that problem. Um, and then slowly releasing them, letting them not pray, letting them not go to church to a certain degree. I, I mean, I still always tell them, if, if you're here and this is what we do, that's what you're going to do. When you leave the home, it's up to you. You don't have to go to church at all. In fact, today I, I spoke to my son. He's looking for college now. And I told him, I said, what do you look for? And, and he told me, and I said, well, how about an Orthodox church close by? I said, but by the way, you don't have to go to church if you don't want to. Uh, I'm just telling you, it may be a good thing to consider that. So at one time, you have to release them. And in fact, I, I almost want to say that a lot of people are afraid when their children uh, leave the church. I'm not. Um, I, I think that's a very healthy thing uh, for many people. Not for all, but for many people, it's a healthy thing. And sometimes it takes people years to come back. But when they do, they come back in full force. You know? which is a, a, an amazing thing. So don't worry about overwhelming them when they're young. When they start getting older, start giving them a little more freedom, but still keep them, keep watch over them. And, and then when they're about to leave for college, I will tell you something that I learned from one of my parishioners who, had, who has three children. Before each of them went to college, he bowed down to the ground in front of each of them and asked for their forgiveness for not being a good parent. And he was a good parent. Uh, but I'm sure that we mess up and we've hurt our children many times. The most important thing as we learn is to offer them love. Uh, that's the most important thing. Uh, and to ask forgiveness from time to time for not offering love. You know, I, 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 I did that again to one of my children recently. Um, I said, remember that time when I did this? Please forgive me for that. Um, you know, those are, those are important things. I, I will tell you forgiveness, how, how important and crucial it is. And I'll end with this. Forgive me for being long-winded here. There is a saint in the Serbian church, St. Justin Popovic. Uh, he lived in the 20th century. And in a monastery where he was a spiritual father, there were many nuns there. 
One of those nuns was a very young nun. I know this nun. I go to her monastery when I go to the, she's an abbess now at one of the monasteries called Preradova. That's close to Kalenich Monastery. And uh, she shared this story with me. Uh, when she was a young nun, they, someone gave them a puppy at the monastery, a little puppy dog. Um, and one of the nuns who worked in the kitchen was carrying some food, tripped over a dog, and spilled all the food. Then she took a stick and just beat this little puppy to the end. Well, that little puppy grew up to be a huge dog. What was interesting, when the nuns would be passing by that dog, which had to be changed because of that nun that beat the dog, the dog wouldn't bark at anyone. But when this nun came, the dog wanted to rip her apart. It was so embarrassing for this nun that she went to Father Justin Popovich, who now is considered a saint, and um, she asked him what to do. And you know what he told her? Go in front of the dog and make three prostrations, bows all the way to the ground, and ask the dog for forgiveness. And she didn't take him seriously. She didn't do it. Well, the dog continued barking at her, and she decided one day that she was going to do that. She literally went in front of the dog, obviously far away, bowed three times, and said, please forgive me. The dog literally stopped barking and never barked at her before. So if asking forgiveness has that much of an impact on a dog, how much more is it going to have an impact on our own children and the people who love us and whom we love? So be ready to love them, but also be ready to ask for forgiveness. Thank you, Father. Oh, anybody else? Any question or comment? This is oh, so great. Story. So we started a really <laughs> wide discussion now. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Father. This was very comforting since I've been uh, asking for forgiveness every, every day. I mean, I've been in urge of asking forgiveness. I've been making mistakes every day. Uh, uh, not be only because these times are challenging, but because the parenting is challenging and uh, it's going to stay like that, probably. Well, I will tell you, I'm sure you have seen it. All of you are church people, I assume. You've gone to church. Before the priest begins liturgy, the first thing he does, even before he asks God for forgiveness, he turns around to the people and he says, forgive me, brethren. In fact, the, 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 the rules of the church are that a priest cannot serve the divine liturgy unless he asks forgiveness. He does it every single liturgy. Um, I, I have a question. Um, this goes back to the... Uh, Old Testament that we had uh, in the previous talk that you had given, and and with respect to this uh, COVID virus, do you do you think um, that this is God's punishment, or I mean, um, like Sodom and Gomorrah? You know, God sent, according to the Old Testament, He sent the angels over there because these people were no good. But this is like, this pandemic here is um, killing a number of people. And um, yeah. specifically I, uh, with, with respect to this virus, um, do you think that this is um, in a way what's happening? Well, I will tell you one thing is I, I don't know if I um, explained myself very well about it, regarding the first topic that actually wasn't even something I wanted to focus on. But I will tell you, I don't believe in, in uh, uh, I, I don't believe that God punishes. Um, I believe that we punish ourselves whenever we step away from God. It's literally like 
being around a fire on a cold day. Um, and sorry, I'm changing my, my position here. I, I, I just realized my phone's about to die. Um, it's literally like being around the fire on a cold day and then stepping away from the fire. The farther we stay, step away from the fire, the colder it's going to be from us, for us. And the same thing with, with uh, our relationship with God. So it's not that he punishes us. It's that we step away from him and therefore we are punished. Um, I, will re I will read something to you um, that Patriarch Pavle of Blessed Memory said. I'm going to try to read it in Serbian and then translate it. Ko neće da se smiri sam. Whoever doesn't want to come down by themselves, smiri će ga život. The life will calm him down. Ali život i nema baš prijatne metode za to. But the life doesn't really have pleasant methods for that. Did, did you understand what I, what I said? Yes. So I yes. think that's, um, um, that's in, in a nutshell, that's what I strongly believe. And that's generally speaking what, what I think we believe in, in, in church. Um, I, I will tell you, that you know we talk about covid covid 19 uh killing people i uh uh or or people dying because of covid 19. um i had several families infected by the virus um none of them were uh some of them many of them were barely sick um one or two of them were somewhat sick, nothing uh, serious. And then I had one person who la actually left the church about 18 years ago uh, who died. And because no one else wanted to go and do the funeral, they called me to, to go and do his, his funeral. He died, as, as I read in the newspaper, because of COVID-19. And the first thing that I said at his funeral was, uh, I read the obituary, and in the obituary it says that Boro Lalic died because of COVID-19. He didn't die because of COVID-19. He died because the Lord called him. You know, it, when the good Lord calls you, you got to go. That's it. It can be a cold. I mean, I've had people perfectly, well, Father Denis Pavicevic's daughter, perfectly fit young lady in her 30s just got married was running as she runs every day for exercise no health issues no problems just dropped dead out of a blue the lord called her that that's it now um the 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 pandemic in general uh, i will say has brought us amazing things um, now, in, in a positive sense, even the death part, and please forgive me for saying no one likes death. I wish death upon no one. Death is something not natural for us, even though it's become natural. That's not something God created. It's something we created uh, by stepping away from him. Death is horrible. Um, and there's nothing nice about it except the fact that when we die, we transfer from this life unto life everlasting. And that's why um, we don't fear death. Uh, you know, we fear our own sinfulness, but we don't fear death because death is actually, from our understanding, belief, and comprehension, and, and reality, it's, there's nothing wrong. In fact, birth should be cried about not that because um as as one of the saints of the early church said uh end of life is unjustly called death in fact it is the liberation of death we are liberated from death when we when we die when we are born we're born into death 
But when we die, we are liberated from that. We are now uh, live forever. So in this situation with the pandemic, not only is it not that horrible as it seems that, that even when, when people are dying, but look at all the, the amazing things that are happening. I mean, I don't know if, if you're witnessing that. I assume that you are. But I, I'll tell you, in my own family, in my own parish, um, we've needed this pause for such a long time. You know, the old, I think it was the old Jews or Egyptians. I'm not sure which one of these older people, maybe the Egyptians. Uh, they had a rule that every seventh year they would not plant crops in order to let the earth rest. Think about that. How long have we been going on without a minute of rest? Rush, 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 rush. It's so bad that for the first time in 20 years that I've been in, in this parish, I'm able to go through my home office. I'm able to put things in place. I'm able to, I, I know this is gonna sound silly, for the first time in 20 years, I have space for my car in my house garage. <laughs> I mean, how horrible is that? We need this. I mean, this is such a blessing. Mine is the part that people are crying and suffering because of, of being alone in the hospital, because of dying, because of having people die. All of that is horrible. There's no doubt. But many other things are, are absolutely necessary and amazing. And I, and I do know from history of mankind dealing with God, God will step away. But when we need him, he will step back in. And when he does, he will take the worst and transform it into that which is best. Well, yeah, it seems like that. Um, yes. Um, some of the scientific data that come forward is that the some of the uh, young men that have contracted COVID and survived actually um, have developed sterility. So <laughs> we are going to a new era where in terms of the um, selection of um, survival, so to speak. That's why I, I, I mean, not because of that, but I looking at these TV things every once in a while. I try to stay away from from news, period. But every once in a while when I see it, and recently I saw some people tearing down statues. And forgive me, I'm not, I'm very pro-science. I, I love science. I wish I was studying uh, as much as Miroslav, for example. And unfortunately I didn't, but I, I thought to myself, if they're tearing down statues because of, of supposedly racism or whatever the case is, they really should find statues of Darwin and get rid of his statue. <laughs> yeah, I think because. they're tearing down history, which is, it's part of our history. And I, I don't know, I, I understand the one side, but also the other side, they have to realize that this is part of uh, who we are and uh, what brought us to today. and. Uh, you know, we, it's a reminder, actually, it's a reminder of how not to behave in the future. And they're tearing everything down because uh, they don't agree with that. But that now who's going to remind us not to behave like that anymore, unless we look at that stuff, unless yes, we look um, at those statues. Unfortunately, unfortunately, everything nowadays, including science, is politically infused. You know, one of my godsons, who is a very prominent professor uh, in Switzerland, and he gives out lectures all over the world, in fact, um, he, um, he um, uh, told me once, he, he, is, he is a true scientist. He, he would, even though he's a fairly young man, he would literally just be uh, reading, writing in a lab, whatever the case is. And when I asked him, what does he love about science? He explained to me and then that nowadays uh, my results 
have a lot, the, the results of my, of my scientific study have a lot to do with the political climate. In other words, I have to come up with results that are favorable to those who are giving me money to do the research themselves. Not the truth, but that which they need. And that's kind of sad to, to hear, to be honest with you. Um, but it is what it is. I mean, we live in the world that's very politically infused nowadays, and everything is. The economy, the science, the linguistics, um, everything. Um, and, and it's a shame. You know, I, I get confused. I, I remember, uh, I mean, I don't get confused nowadays, but I remember when I just came back from finishing one of the seminaries in Serbia and I've left America for I think almost seven eight years and I was 15 when I left so I was a young man I totally was out of the, the loop and I came into contact with a person once who asked me are you pro-life or pro-choice and I know now it's silly to to talk about that but back then i looked at him and i said well i'm both and he was confused you know and and he says how can you be both i said well i am i am absolutely for for a person choosing because god gave them the right to choose the freedom to choose but i would never be for abortion you know i would always choose life you know it was an interesting conversation that, that then I ended up uh, thinking about for many years after that, um, how a, a normal person has been uh, split up by, by the politics in this country and in every country for that matter. You know, I, it's just a tough, tough, um, tough season we are going through, that's for sure. And you know, I'll I'll end with this, and I'll let you go because I I I think it's it's coming. It's a it's been a long gathering, but um, I don't know if you maybe have seen this, and I don't even know if this is true or not. But there is a video circulating out there on the internet where a big eagle down in Florida um, went down into the water and snatched up a huge shark. So this <laughs> eagle is carrying a shark in the air and someone commented it wouldn't surprise me in the year 2020 <laughs> oh well, thank you so much thank well, you too. It was great listening to you and i hope uh, we will get you again back thank you father thank yeah, you so much for such uh, so many interesting uh, topics and subtopics uh, that you touched and discussed uh, this was really inspirative for all of us i guess thank you very much Thank you very much, Father. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Remember, remember me and us in prayer, please. Please keep us also in your prayers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Yeah.